plus. That's a, a powerful word in the context of God dealing with man. God will recompense. He says so. Um, recompense means to repay, to repay. When man wrongs God, God will repay. He will recompense. He will pay back. He will return that. He'll require of that. Uh, you may have heard of the famous sermon from R.G. Lee that's probably 100 years old by now, Payday Someday. Uh, I love, I've probably listened to that message dozens of times. Uh, he talked about Ahab and Jezebel, how there would be a payday for what they did. Ahab, that vile toad that squatted upon the throne of Israel. Uh, that's how R.G. Lee uh, spoke of that. But really, it's not just Ahab and Jezebel. It's all throughout the Bible. God is continually giving examples of the fact that payday is coming. Recompense is coming. When man offends God, God will pay back. Uh, every uh, bit that our sin debt digs us, every bit of the hole that our sin debt digs, um, God repays it all, and it's, it is coming back. Uh, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Um, well, why is that, and, and what does that tell us about? Uh, God makes every wrong right. That's what a recompense talks about. Our passage here talks about a recompense, God paying man back, returning, returning back the offense that was done to him. Uh, God's going to pay that back, and uh, that means he settles scores. Much has been done. Sin does wrong. God makes right. God uh, brings it all back and repays and, and recompenses. That's his vengeance. Uh, the recompense of God makes a statement about a number of things uh, about his nature. Is God really just? Is God really holy? Yes, and that's why there's recompense. Uh, if God did not recompense, he would not be just. Because of his justice, because of his holiness, he must recompense. He must pay back. He can't leave uh, what was. He can't leave an injustice out hanging without fixing it. God is a fixer. God will make everything right. Uh, it makes a statement. The recompense of God makes a statement about Bible doctrines. The doctrine of hell is uh, is supported by God recompensing. Uh, the, the, we could look at a, dozens of scriptures. Is there really a hell? Of course there is. God says it over and over. Why? Because he recompenses. Uh, the doctrine of chastening. We're, we're God's children through his son. He's our father. According to Hebrews 12, John chapter 1, he chastens. Uh, and that's the same attribute from which his recompensing comes. There's chastening. There's recompense. It also makes a statement about the reliability of his word. God says he'll recompense. He'll right the wrongs. He'll settle the scores, but it hasn't been done yet. Not every wrong has been righted yet. Not every score has been settled yet, and God says he will. And uh, eschatology and prophecy, and when we look toward the things that uh, are in our future that God tells us, the things that God says are going to happen, but they haven't happened yet, um, what's the purpose of those things? We talk about the tribulation, and we talk about all the things that are ahead. Uh, Armageddon, What's God going to, what's he doing? He's recompensing. He's making the wrongs right. Uh, and he's settling the scores and there's eternal death and all these things. And, and uh, do we really believe him when he says, I'll make them all right. I'll pay everything back and, and I'll recompense. Uh, that that uh, explains prophecy, the reliability of his word. They must come to pass. He must settle scores. He must repay because of his justice. Deuteronomy 32, 35, to me belongeth vengeance and recompense. To me belongeth vengeance and recompense. Oh, that's just Deuteronomy. That's just Old Testament. That's just the days of Moses. We're under the New Testament now. We're under grace now. God was a big meanie head back in the Old Testament, and he was grumpy and cantankerous and irritable back in the Old Testament, but we're in the New Testament now, so God is just a big, fluffy, soft teddy bear now. Then how come Romans quotes Deuteronomy 32, 35? Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. That's in the New Testament. That's Romans uh, echoing back what was said in Deuteronomy. Uh, it's not just Romans. First Thess uh, 2 Thessalonians 1, 6, it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. 2 Thessalonians 1, 8, inflaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God who obey not the gospel of Christ. Vengeance, recompense, Hebrews 2, 2, Every transgression and disobedience and disobedience receives a just recompense of reward. So it is a New Testament doctrine as well. And we'll see those two words in uh, verse 8 here of our text tonight. Uh, Isaiah 34, we'll read the first eight verses of this chapter, and we'll see those two terms 
in the last verse that we'll read this evening. The Bible says, Come near, ye nations, to hear, and hearken, ye people. Let the earth hear in all that is therein, the world and all things that come forth of it. For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations, and his fury upon all their armies. He hath utterly destroyed them, he hath delivered them to the slaughter. Their slain also shall be cast out, and their stink shall come up out of their carcasses, and the mountains shall be melted with their blood. How many of you are going to print that verse and put it on the wall of the, of the nursery? <laughs> you know, or uh, put that one on your bumper, or on a nice fluffy pillow. <laughs> uh, verse 4, And all the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll. I think the lyrics of it as well with my soul are based on that verse. The, shall be rolled together as a scroll. And all their hosts shall fall down, as the leaf falleth off from the vine, and as a falling fig from the fig tree. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Idumea, and upon the people of my curse to judgment. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made fat with fatness, and with the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of the kidneys of rams. For the Lord hath a sacrifice in Basra, and a great slaughter in the land of Idumea. And the unicorns shall come down with them. Now, those aren't flying horses. Uh, rhinos, animals with one horn. All right. The unicorns shall come down with them, and the bullocks with the bulls, and their land shall be soaked with blood, and their dust made fat with fatness. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance, and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance, and the year of recompenses for the controversy of of Zion. So I'll title our message tonight, Vengeance and Recompense, um, just taking those two terms from verse 8 uh, and talking a little bit about this. Um, Jesus quoted this passage. Jesus referred to this passage. He was teaching on the coming tribulation. In Luke chapter 21, uh, Jesus had gone through some, uh, some statements of fact that will describe and characterize the coming tribulation that was many years off in his day, maybe getting very close to our day. And then when he described the tribulation, he said, uh, for these be the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. He was referring to Isaiah 34 verses, seven, verses really one through eight. The, he said, hey, what I'm describing to you now when I talk about this coming tribulation, that is the vengeance that Isaiah talked about. And so uh, we do see a lot of those uh, things in the book of Revelation when we talk about the tribulation, the sixth seal and all of that. And so God's going to recompense. And we know for sure that he'll recompense in the world to come, but he recompenses in this world too. And that's why the book of Revelation does get pretty graphic. And that's why this is a graphic passage. And it's fulfilled in Revelation 19 and some other places in Revelation that talk about the seals of judgment being poured out, the wrath of God being poured out, uh, that battle of Armageddon, the enemies of the Lord gathered against him and how, how short of work he makes of them. And, and it's, it uses no uncertain terms to describe uh, the death of those that gather against the Lord. They're recompensed, and, and uh, his vengeance is taken out on them. Uh, and so we see that. So let's give you a few, a few things tonight. Number one, who are the people to be recompensed? The people to be recompensed. We'll look at the people. We'll look at the tragedy of the recompense, and we'll look at the severity of the recompense. But the people who he's talking about here uh, is Idumea. Um, it says in verse 5, For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Idumea. Idumea there is mentioned again in verse 6. Basra, there's a sacrifice in Basra. That's the capital of Idumea. And so what is this talking about? Well, Idumea is another way of saying Edom. Uh, Edom is the nation that came from Esau. So this is talking about the descendants of Esau. Idumea is the descendants of Esau. So they are the people who will serve as a type that represents a certain kind of person. It's not specifically only and exclusively about Idumea, because look at verse 1. Verse 1 says this is to the whole world, it's to the whole earth. And so the, the people of Idumea are a, re a representative or are typical of a certain kind of person that's found through the whole earth, through the whole world. Uh, and so Idumea is used as a way to describe exactly what they're all about and who they are. Uh, again, they're the descendants of Esau. What is Esau most notorious for? Giving up his birthright. Esau forfeited, willingly gave up his birthright. He sold it. Esau, when he 
gave up his birthright, he said, it won't profit me. I'm hungry, and that birthright wouldn't profit me. My birthright will not profit me. He said, I don't need it. I don't need it right now. I've got other things that matter more. His flesh mattered more. Satisfying his uh, carnal appetites mattered more. He turned down the birthright. He, he declined it. He said it wouldn't help him, wouldn't profit him. Uh, the New Testament explains to us that, that when Esau declined his birthright and gave it up and sold him, the New Testament in Hebrews tells us that that had to do with his being a, a fornicator and a profane person. Not just some poor, unfortunate, hungry chap who just wanted, just wanted another bite to live. It, 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 that, that wasn't what it was. He was a fornicator and a profane person, according to the New Testament. And then it tells us that after he parted with his birthright, he hated it. He hated it. So we're talking about a birth. What is the New Testament equivalent of that? What is the New Testament parallel of a birth? It's the new birth. It's the second birth. It's ye must be born again. Marvel not that I said unto you, ye must be born again. Every man in the world uh, is offered an opportunity to be born again. Every man gets light, and it's God's desire for every man to be born again, but every man gets the same decision that Esau had. Do I decline it? Do I forfeit it? Do I choose not to, to have it? Do I sell it? Do I prefer money? Do I prefer other things? Uh, will I say, that wouldn't profit me. I don't need that. I don't want that. That's not important. That's why so many aren't born again. They don't think they need it. They think that doesn't matter to me now. They've got carnal appetites to satisfy. They're fornicators and profane persons. And that's why so many refuse Christ. They want to keep their profanity. They want to keep their fornication. They choose the appetites and the carnalities of the flesh, just like Esau did. And just like Esau, they'll come to hate it. Esau despised and hated his birthright after he sold it. And how many refuse Christ, refuse to be born again, don't think it'll profit them, decline it, pass on it, don't want it, don't think they need it. And then they develop a hatred for those that do. For those who do have it, Jesus told us that they would hate us. Jesus told us they would hate him. You know, uh, you're not greater than your Lord. They hated your Lord. They're going to hate you too. Uh, and, and he told us they'll want to kill you. They're, uh, Esau wanted to kill Jacob. And Jesus said in John 16, they're going to want to kill you. They'll think they'll, they're doing God's service by killing you. Uh, and so there's a, a, comp, a, a, a comparison there. It's comparable. And so that analogy holds really that the Edomites are bad guys throughout the Old Testament. They're unbelievers. They... Uh, they were opponents of God. They were um, against God and hated the God and the people of God in the days of Moses, in the days of David. And then even that uh, the prophet Obadiah singled out the Edomites. He said when, when Judah is besieged by Nebuchadnezzar and, and the Jews are running and in need and in a time of crisis and their homes are being ravaged and torn up and a carnage everywhere, uh, the, the Edomites really aided the Babylonians and did not offer any assistance at all to the Jews uh, and because the Edomites hated God's people all along. Uh, and so who do we know that came from that line? The Herods. The Herods came from the line of Edom. There's not really a good Herod that's mentioned. There's several Herods in the New Testament. They're all bad guys. Interestingly, uh, there is a, a legend, a Talmudic legend or tradition that suggests that those who, who formed the Roman Empire in their early days that they were descendants from the Edomites. And I don't know if that can be confirmed or denied with uh, any kind of DNA testing or not. I haven't uh, looked all that thoroughly into that, but uh, some scholars believe that because, because the Roman Empire and later Roman Catholicism can be tied historically to the Edomites, that this reference to Idumea here may be a judgment upon Roman Catholicism. I think that's probably a bit of a stretch, but uh, interesting to point out that some, some feel that way. Uh, but so Idumea is mentioned here in verses 5 and 6 that there's a judgment and a curse on them. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Idumea and upon the people of my curse. See, they're unbelievers. They don't have God's blessing. When you don't have a blessing, what do you have? You have a curse. God says, I set before you this day a blessing or a curse. You can have a blessing or a curse. It's pretty simple. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. The love of God is in Christ Jesus. You have him or you don't. Nobody's partially saved. Nobody's kind of saved. Nobody is a little, bit of, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. You're either saved or you're not. It's possible to be saved and not live with God's blessing. It's possible to be saved and not have 
God's blessing on your decisions in your life. But in general, as far as your eternal soul goes, you've either got a blessing or a curse. Well, hold on. But I know nice people who are lost. How could, how could they be going to hell? How could they be cursed? They're nice. They're, they're kind and, and help people cross the road and they take care of their pets and they smile. How could they be going to hell? How could they be cursed? How could they be uh, coming into the sword of God, the bloody sword of God that's described here? Because all that matters is whether they have Christ or not. And it's great to be nice. I'm glad people are nice, but being nice doesn't get anyone out of hell. And being nice doesn't get anyone out of this judgment that's pronounced, this curse that's pronounced on those that do not have Christ, do not have the living God through belief in his son. There's a curse that's mentioned here in verse five, of people of my curse. The people of my curse. Uh, Galatians 1 uses the word curse. It says, if any man come unto you and preach any other gospel than that I've preached unto you, let him be a curse. All other religions are cursed. Only the true biblical gospel of God, gospel of Christ, the true gospel of, uh, of free, it's a free gift. It's not works. Uh, only that is blessed. Every other gospel is cursed. Every other belief out there about eternity, about our soul, it's all cursed. It's all under the curse of God and going to be recompensed. Galatians 3 tells us that the whole understanding of works salvation is cursed. Uh, anyone that is believing that their works will save them, their, their gospel is cursed. It's not of God, it's cursed. It won't save. And that pretty accurately sums up those who will be alive at the end of the tribulation, at the battle of Armageddon, who are, who are not in Christ, they're under a curse. And that's why the things that are described here very accurately parallel what's described in Revelation when Jesus comes back uh, and, and deals with them and, and recompenses their evil to them. So that's number one, the people of the curse. Number two, the tragedy, or pardon me, the, the people of the recompense. Number two, the tragedy of the recompense. The tragedy of the recompense. There's a word that's used twice here. One is in, once is in verse two. For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations and his fury upon all their armies. There's armies in Revelation. He hath utterly destroyed them. He hath delivered them to the slaughter. Slaughter. We find that word again in Verse six, the Lord hath a, a sacrifice in Basra and a great slaughter in the land of Idumea. That word stands out to me because it's also found in Isaiah 53, maybe the greatest chapter of the book of Isaiah, verse seven. It talks about Jesus and his first appearance here. Not the second one, but, uh, but his, uh, his first one. And it says that he is, he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. He was slaughtered. This says he'll be doing the slaughtering but first, he was slaughtered. He was the lamb to the slaughter. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. You know, we think of slaughterhouses. Most of us find that unsettling. You know, we're not really an agricultural people. Most of us don't have livestock. Maybe you got a couple chickens running around, but, you know, we don't live in the days where we did our own, you know, most people did their own slaughtering, and, and that's just not really part of our customs that we're familiar with in our day. And so when we drive along the highway and we can see uh, an area and if we if for whatever reason we know that's a slaughterhouse we'd generally rather not think about that we like to have the meat on our table we don't really like to think about where it came from let somebody else handle that we're, we're unsettled by that because it is it's terrible it is bloody it is graphic we're horrified by that and that's what our savior went through for us he was slaughtered he chooses to use that word to describe the cross we have a lamb that was slaughtered for us According to Isaiah 53, he says, I was slaughtered to be your sacrifice. Jesus says, I am your substitute. I will give the sacrifice that you owe. I will be your substitute. I, you ought to be slaughtered, but I, will, I am offering to be slaughtered for you. I'm willing, I'll be slaughtered for you. Think of uh, the lambs in line headed into the slaughterhouse. You think of their little pens and the herds of them, and, and they don't really know what's ahead. They're being processed. <laughs> to use a, a term that's less offensive, I suppose, headed for death. And not that lambs talk to each other, but you can kind of imagine one lamb that's not part of that flock, that hasn't been captured, that's free, and that's spotless, that's a pure lamb, uh, says to one of them in line, I'll, I'll be your substitute. You want to just swap with me? I'm free. I'll get in your place, and I'll go to that slaughter for you. I'll take what's awaiting you, and I'll do it for you. You just have to say yes. That's 
all you have to do is, is, is say yes and we'll swap. We'll, 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 uh, we'll be, I'll be your substitute. How, how tragic and absurd and foolish for the lamb to say, no, I'm all set. No, I'm good. No, I'll be all right. No, that, that won't profit me. No, I've got, I've, got, I've got some other ideas about all that. No, I've, I think I've got this figure. I think I'm fine. I think I'll be all right. What does man say? That, that's what God offers to everyone that receives the trap. That's what God offers to everyone you talk to about their soul. That's what God offers to every lost person that comes in here and occupies one of these seats and leaves lost. He's saying, I'll go to the slaughter for you. I've already gone. But if, if you say no, then you stay in line and you get slaughtered. Jesus, I, I, I'll take it for you. I have already. You just have to be willing to make that swap. But if you don't want to, guess where you're going? What Isaiah 34 says, slaughter. That word pretty accurately sums up Revelation 19 and what takes place at the Battle of Armageddon. Total consumption. Um, the Lord will either pay your price for you or exact that price of you. He'll either pay your price for you or exact that price of you. You're all saved. You're born again. You don't have to worry about that, but you think of, think of your lost relatives. Think of every uh, unregenerated person we come across. That's their decision. You can either uh, let Jesus pay all of it or you can try to pay it yourself, and you'll never be able to pay it all because the, the, the holiness of God is infinite, and every sin offends God infinitely. Well, but, but isn't a million years in hell enough? Nope, God is that holy, and sin is that ugly. Hell, Armageddon, he'll, he'll bring that recompense both in this world and in the world to come. And, and it's interesting that this passage uses the word slaughter twice, and it describes that battle of Armageddon where the people there who are being slaughtered have refused, have you refused the slaughter of Isaiah 53. They said they didn't need it, and now they're the ones being slaughtered. And it's interesting that the, the most popular title Jesus uses in the book of Revelation is the Lamb. He's, he's the Lamb who was slaughtered coming back to slaughter them who refused him as the Lamb to the slaughter. That, that's amazing. <laughs> he's, he is just an amazing Lord. Total consumption. This talks about verses, uh, it goes down through to talk about these sacrifices, verses seven, uh, six and seven. What it's saying is that their, their recompense, their destruction will be as complete, and they'll be totally consumed like one of those animals in the Old Testament sacrifices would be totally consumed. Not uh, all that pleasant to, uh, to think about, but uh, so that's the people of the recompense. Number two, the tragedy of the recompense. Lastly, number three, the severity of the recompense. The severity. You know, this is... Uh, Again, not a passage you're going to read at the high school graduation. or, or uh, It's scary. And we just read a passage about blood and guts and gore and, and, and indignation and fury. It's violent. There's slaughter. We've got bloody swords. It talks about dead bodies not being buried, and that matches up in Revelation as well. It talks about stars falling. That matches up in Revelation as well. But, uh, but why the severity? Why all the ugliness? You know, people often ask the same questions about hell. Why, well, why is it so bad? Why is it described so graphically? And why, why is it so terrible? And why is there so much agony? Uh, how could that, uh, a God who, who ordained that really be good? And those questions are often asked. Understand, every single lost man who has ever lived won't be at Armageddon. Uh, not every lost person who goes out in eternity without Christ will be at Armageddon. Just the ones who happen to be alive on the earth at that time, which is many. Um, so God will, he'll, he'll bring, he'll recompense everyone in the world to come in, in the next life. Uh, but in this one, he'll do it for all that are here at the time when he returns. But, uh, but the first thing I would say to that question is, you know, God doing what he says he will do is not dependent on whether or not we understand his reasons or purposes for us. And a lot of people say, no, I just, I can't fathom why this, and, and well, I know the Bible says this and says this and says this, but, but I don't get why he would do that, and it doesn't make sense to me, and I don't like it, and so therefore, because I, I can't understand it, it must not be true. It must not be reliable, and now I just don't believe that book. You know, religious people with that book, and that's really a, a, such a sad thing because God is going to do what he says he's going to do, whether I understand it or not. Now, in his grace and mercy, he gives us so much understanding, and he answer, the, questions are all, the answers to all our questions are there if we'll look for them by faith and, and receive them by faith and obedience, um, but, but he doesn't have to do that. 
that's only in his grace and mercy that he answers our questions. We don't really need answers. All we need to say is, all right, if that's what he says he's going to do. That's what he's going to do. Whether I understand his reasons, whether I understand his purposes or not. Sometimes we, we think we're entitled to more explanations than we're really entitled to. We think we're owed something by God that he doesn't really owe us. Uh, but but we, think we're, we think we are sometimes. Well, well, so let me just give you a couple of these here. Why the severity, why the, this uh, explosive nature of it here? Some save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. The book of Jude says some save with fear. Fear helps people get saved. Fear is what got me saved. Now, I, I'm thankful it's both fear and love, but, but fear helps us get saved. Reading about the horrors of what happens to those without Christ, you know what that gives to the gospel? Urgency, incentive. That gives added appeal to the pull of the gospel when you find out what will happen to you without it. And when God lays it out there for you, it's bloody, it's gory, it's graphic, it's terrible. And you go, yeah, I don't want that. I don't, I don't want to go there if that's what God says it's like. And so it, I want, I, if, if believing this gospel gets me out of that, I, I want it. I need it. It also shows us how much is at stake. It emphasizes how essential salvation is. And once we've believed it, it gives us a far greater sense of appreciation for it and relief and gratitude that we're saved from that. And, and really, it's the King James that stays provocative in the language that's used. Uh, the modern versions try to soften the language to make it more tasteful. And so they dilute it and they water it down. And it, well, let's just tame this word. And, and where blood is used, where the King James says it's bloody, there's blood on that sword. Uh, the, the other versions will say, well, no, it's not blood, it's just death. And where the King James says it's hell, hell is where they're going. The modern versions say, well, it's just, it's just decay. It's just Hades, it's just the underworld. It's just, it's just the grave. They'll substitute the grave in where, where the King James says hell because God wants us to be put off by those things and he wants to see how terrible it is. He wants that language to pull us to the gospel. What happens when you soften? When you water it down, it starts to go, that's eh, not so bad. And since the modern versions have been prevalent, a lot fewer people are getting saved. There's a lot less to be afraid of. There's a lot less to fear when, when eh, it's just a, little, just a little gathering down there, just a little underground bunch of people. It's not bloody. It's not flames. It's not hell. So what happens when we abandon the King James. It also demonstrates how serious God is. The use of this kind of language demonstrates how serious God is. People are so flippant and cavalier toward the things of God and toward their sin. People think, well, you just, you just kind of live and do what you want to do and do whatever you want, and maybe you'll take this religion or maybe you'll take that religion, but there's not really a whole lot of connection between the two. Yes, there is. Everything that a man does is a statement about what he thinks about God. Everything we do reflects what we believe and think about God. And when, when man sins, it, it reflects his offense to God, his blasphemy against God, and that's serious. It's very serious. So he recompenses. You, sometimes you wonder, people sometimes whine and gripe when they look at the apparent success of the ungodly. Christians and believers all say, man, how, how come these people are so wrong and wicked and, and lewd and, and ungodly, but they seem to be doing so well? Why, why does God allow that? It amazes me that we can continue to have that conversation while there's passages like this in the Bible. God, God's telling you, there's going to be a sword dipped in blood. There's going, to, there's going to be a slaughter of them. It's not going to end well. He's going to recompense. And he keeps telling us, this is how, this is how much I will recompense. And we probably should say, all right, I believe you. <laughs> even, even ones that, that don't seem like they have any problems yet, they will, because God is just. I'm just thankful that I took the substitution. I'm so thankful that Jesus said, I'll go to the slaughter for you. I'm glad I'll never have to see the inside of that slaughterhouse because Jesus loved me that much. He paid what I could never, ever pay with his infinite mercy, his infinite love, his infinite sacrifice, his infinite holiness, the, the, the debt we owed and could never pay. He paid it all. He took our place. And, uh, and so we don't have to worry about these things, but they do invigorate us and motivate us to, to get his message to as many people as we can.